Anno Domini by Hilaire Belloc. You will have occasion for some time to come to write, more than once, the figures 1941. Whenever you inscribe this mystic number, breathe to yourself some word in memory of the man to whom you are indebted for that date. His name was Dionysius, and he was an abbot in Rome during that strange time when the history of England disappears and runs underground like the River Mole. The darkness between Germanus and Augustine. For he flourished, as the phrase goes, about 1400 years ago in the earlier part of the 6th century, and it seems that the one date about him on which we can be certain is that he was dead by 544. Now it was his computation of the date of the Nativity, or rather, of the Incarnation, which became gradually accepted throughout Christendom. Very gradually. You cannot say that it had become commonplace everywhere until well into the Crusades nearly 600 years after his death, and I have read somewhere that his fixing of the era by which we now everywhere reckon the years was not even taken over fully in Spain until the 14th century. You will find what I suppose to be the decisive phrase in Migne, that half of Migne which prints the Latin fathers, and in the 67th volume thereof Dionysius writes, quote, we do not wish to mix up our memorials with impious and persecuting men, end quote. He means with the Roman emperors of the earlier pagan times, quote, but rather did we choose to note the sequence of years from the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ, end quote. And that date he put just after the middle of the 8th century from the traditional founding of Rome, on the Roman calendar 753 to 754. He was almost certainly wrong, as are most pioneers and founders. How wrong, we do not know. There are all sorts of guesses based on all sorts of slight fragmentary evidence. For instance, we have the death of Herod of, in 4 BC, but those who understand these things, which I do not pretend to do, will have it that his year one may have been anything from four years too late, as is more probable, to seven years too early. But it took root, and you will not shift it now, neither you nor millions with you, not all the revolutionaries, nor all the overlearned. I suppose it is about as firm a thing as the past has left us, is the computation of the years A.D. and B.C. This Dionysius was called, or nicknamed, the Little, the Short, the Exegus, and as it is as Dionysius Exegus that he is remembered to distinguish him among the other Dionysiuses from the Aeropagite and the martyred people apostle of Paris onwards. The little we know about him is mostly from a few pat phrases written by a fellow student of his, a younger friend who counted much more than he, Cassiodorus. Cassiodorus is the larger figure, partly because he was richer, partly because he did much in the politics of his time, in part also because what he has to say about the motley imperial garrison of barbarian soldiers then in Italy, and their chief has helped a certain modern school to crack up the Germans at the expense of the rest of us, a favorite game of the 19th century. This friend, Cassiodorus, with three generations of great wealth behind him, full of music, writing much, wrote thus about Dionysius. Quote, there was also in my time among many great men Dionysius the monk, a Scythian by race, but altogether Roman, most learned in Latin and Greek. He lived his life God-fearing like a high master. There was in him a great carriage, but with it great simplicity, doctrine, and humility. I would like to say more about him, but I must get on with my work." End quote. Whereupon Cassiodorus goes on to say more about him, after having promised not to do so, which is what one might expect of a public man dealing with public affairs. The rest that he has to say about his friend ends up very prettily, even finally. Quote, he has left this evil time of ours and has been received into peace and we must believe that his conversation is now in the household of God." End quote. But Cassiodorus could not guess how vast a fabric would extend from the labors of this one man. He did not know that all these centuries later the whole world of our white civilization would be taking his date for our era as a matter of course, nor did Dionysius himself know it. Had he known it, he might have spoiled in his humility, though it is even said that he called himself or was called the little by way of humble modesty. I would prefer to believe that he was so-called because he was not tall. Thus he falls into the company of those many fixed names, or great men if you prefer, prefer to call them so, who had the advantage of few inches and therefore much energy. Strong hearts with little work to do than have the hearts of taller men. 
He may be greeted by Napoleon and Wellington and Charles I of England and Canute and any numbers of others who, perhaps when they were boys, were ashamed of their stature but found, later on, that the defect was an advantage. I have said that his system grew slowly in public esteem. I read that it was first adopted at all widely in England under the influence of Bede, the Venerable Bede, about two centuries after that system had been launched, or at any rate crystallized. From England it spread southward, and Gaul was taking it up in the beginning sort of a way within a lifetime, but the papal chancery did not use it for another two hundred years. No one ever made it official, and no one can properly tell you how it developed roots so firm and so penetrating. But I'd say it again, it is established now more decidedly than any other act of all our long history. There is no more favorite diversion among dons than the changing of things, which it should rather be the duty of the learned to conserve. If everybody has been saying Magna Charta for generations, it is a delight to them to call it Carta. If our father said and wrote Thomas a Becket, they must needs make it Becket. Thus also they have monstrously struck in an E after the A of Alfred, just to show that they had read Anglo-Saxon, and as far as the Senlac of Vitalis, instead of plain hat Hastings, I have written on this so often that I dare not repeat the objection now. They have turned the pronunciation of Latin, whereof we might have made a common tongue for general intercourse, quite upside down, consonants and vowels and diphthongs, so that my contemporaries can remember at least three quite different ways of pronouncing the simplest Latin phrase three different fashions succeeding each other in the short space of one human life. Perhaps a fourth is coming along. One can never feel safe in such things. They whitewash every villain. They degrade, degrade and malign every hero. They have shifted the ten islands from Britain to Spain, and one of them, not so long ago, solemnly propounded the theory that a tragedy of Aeschylus was written by Eur Eur Euripides, telling us that the effort was not beyond a precious southern boy. Dons are capable of anything, save one thing. They will never shift A.D. and B.C. They will never turn this year of grace into 1943 or 1932. It has come to stay. Such is the glory of Dionysius Exegus, and since it is proper that glory should be made eternal by the poets, let us remember him so. As Diodorus Siculus is immortalized in the lyric, Diodorus Siculus made himself ridiculous, so let Dionysius have his, breath his deathless rhyme, thus... Dionysius Exegus was wrong, but not ambiguous. With that tribute, I leave him.